Hello, I would like to welcome you to my series of analysis of Chopin's posthumous pieces. There is quite a lot of music written by Chopin that was not published during his lifetime. For many reasons. Some of those pieces are pieces written when Chopin was a child, when he was a teenager, and he never thought of publishing them during his life because he had so many much better pieces of music to, to be published, and he didn't want his name to be connected with that poor music. Poor for him, of course. Some of the pieces were simply gifts to usually some beautiful ladies. Some of the pieces, um, like the last mazurkas, he didn't finish. Um, about fantasy and property, I've already recorded a video and you probably know that there were two reasons why it was not published. One of them was because it was similar to some other impromptu written by uh, Moscheles, I think. And another reason was probably because uh, there was a very prominent woman who ordered this piece for Chopin and she ordered it with the contract in which it said that it must not be published because she wanted this to be exclusively for her. We don't know exactly 100% what was the truth, we can only uh, suppose. But the fact is, when Chopin was dying, he had his last wish. And actually he had two last wishes. The first last wish was that he wanted to take out his heart and bring it back to Poland, to Warsaw. And another last wish was that he wanted all his music that was in his room to be burned in the fire and destroyed. When I think about it and I think about myself, I have mixed feelings because if I were to die and I had a lot of my music that I didn't like so much, um, I don't know if I would really want it to be destroyed. Because what difference does it make for me when I'm dead if this music is played by somebody or not? If if somebody likes it, uh, why not? But on the other hand, you know, this is an ethical problem because both Chopin's sister and his friend, but mostly his sister and family, uh, had this ethical problem, what to do. Should they um, follow Chopin's wish or should they deny it uh, and decided to publish those music. And it's thanks to Chopin's sister, Ludwika, uh, that we have this music of Chopin. Uh, pieces like we are going to analyze in this uh, series of mine. Um, pieces that for many of you are very well known and very familiar. Among them, such beautiful nocturnes, like Nocturne in E minor or Nocturne in C sharp minor, Fantasy and Prompti, uh, and um, some of Mazurkas, a lot of beautiful waltzes. Um, so quite a lot of music, which of course is not maybe that polished, maybe not that sophisticated, like pieces that Chopin published himself. But it's a nice addition to what we already have. But I want to um, quote to you in this video um, a little bit from the book um, um, written by Alan Walker about this problem. Ludwika had the pressing concern and difficult years. Uh, it was the fate of Chopin's unpublished manuscripts. It was considerable body of work which she wanted to see published despite Chopin's own wishes to the contrary. And 
well, I, I will not read the whole because it's um, it's quite a long text and we want to proceed to the today's uh, piece of music. But just to tell you that they decided to f uh, ask uh, Chopin's friend, Julian Fontana, who was also a lawyer and who was also a great pianist and whose handwriting was very similar to Chopin's, to take care of this. Why the lawyer was needed? Because can you imagine that um, shortly after Chopin's death, and now I quote Alan Walker, unauthorized versions of his unpublished works had begun to appear. Can you imagine? People wanted to make money out of the poor Chopin and his death. In 1851, the family of Chopin came across two mazurkas in G major and B flat major, unknown to them, which had been published without permission by the firm of Rudolf Friedlein in Warsaw. In Warsaw. The following year, two waltzes, now they are um, numbered opus 69, number two, opus 70, number two, were also published without permission by the firm of Rudolf, sorry, without permission uh, by the firm of Wild in Krakow, and so on. So the Fontana, Fontana decided to publish all those pieces that they had simply to avoid this unauthorized publishing and then to sue those people who publish this music without the permission of Chopin's family. So it was, you know, this is life. This is life. And um, maybe thanks to this, uh, also, uh, Ludwika, Chopin's sister, decided to um, deny Chopin's wish, to not to listen to him. Because anyway, this music would somehow um, emerge. S maybe not all of it, but most of these pieces. Um, so, that's the story of posthumous works, but I really want to put it clear here, because for many people in the world, they don't know uh, if some piece was uh, composed by Chopin, I mean, it was published by Chopin with his permission, and or not. Everything depends, and also we have to know one thing, and up to Opus 65, all the pieces are um, published by Chopin, with a little exception of maybe Sonata, Opus 4, uh, which was kind of published in Poland, but in a different publisher. It was not really published worldwide, but it still has its opus number. Um, and from Opus 66, so from Fantasy and Property, Everything that we have um, after, all these pieces are posthumous, and we have to uh, separate them, because this is not as sophisticated, it's not as um, co uh, accomplished by Chopin as were his other pieces of music that he himself published. Today, I want to uh, kind of start this series of posthumous works by the first ever piece that Chopin composed. Seven years old Chopin. So we have the year 1817. And let's just imagine a seven years old boy who come to his parents and is saying, Mom, Dad, Please come sit. I composed the piece. I composed the music. Maybe he said, my teacher helped me to write it down. We don't know. But let's look at this. I composed. What the piece uh, he composed? The Polonaise. Polonaise in G minor. And now, why seven years old boy decided to compose Polonaise? Why not a waltz? Why not mazurka? Or some Polish folk dance? Why not some kind of childish title? Why not the etude or study or, you know, uh, Polonaise? I was thinking about it quite a lot and I came up to the conclusion that I think is the closest to the truth. 
Chopin was raised and um, he was surrounded by, of course, his family, uh, his father, who was French, but he was a French emigrant who came to Poland when he was in his 20s and who absorbed very much all the Polish culture and he even uh, he was even fighting in one of the previous Polish uprisings so he felt Polish and his mother was very Polish you know so um, I mean very Polish if I can say so she was Polish from from the ascendant um, so they raised Chopin in this deeply patriotic um, environment because at that time when Chopin was born there was no Poland in the map of Europe we were under the occupancy of three countries so but among Polish people there was a very strong uh, nationalistic feelings because they wanted our their country back so they were talking about it every day um, between in, 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 in their families with their friends and the young boy who grew up he was you know absorbing this like a sponge and also because of that later Chopin's music is so patriotic so the the fact that he composed the Polonaise which was the Polish dance but it was a dance of aristocracy not of you know folk um, countryside uh, music aristocracy and it was full of uh, pride a very proud music he decides to compose a polonaise maybe he probably he saw uh, some polonaises and maybe he played some earlier polonaises written by other composers let's see what co uh, a piece he composed as the first ever piece so let's imagine we are his parents he sits and he plays for them.
this piece is very special to me because it always makes me think about my beloved mother. I remember uh, every time when I was playing this, well, I, I didn't play it as a child actually. Many of you, if you are played the piano, maybe you played it when you were very young, um, but I didn't. Um, but I learned it much later um, just to play it sometimes on concerts because I found it extremely amusing and interesting for the audience to show them the first piece that Chopin wrote. And uh, every time I played it, I was still living with my parents that time and I learned it and every time she came to my room and she told me, oh, what a beautiful piece, what a sweet melody, uh, what is this? And then I said, oh, this is Chopin and he was seven. Oh, how cute, how nice. And, and it happened many times when I practiced this, she, my, my mother was not a musician, uh, but she loved music. So she came to me and she said, and she said, oh, please play for me this beautiful uh, me melody written by young Mozart, uh, sorry, young Chopin, uh, young Chopin, and I played. So um, till now I really love to play um, this piece because it, it makes me think about her. But uh, let's make analysis now of this um, little masterpiece, I would say. I don't think it's an exaggeration and I will prove to you that even a seven years old Chopin had this kind of sense of uh, uh, good um, proportions in music. So, I want us to, um, to, to see how good um, observer Chopin was. Seven years old Chopin who will present us how well he could see everything that was around him. Um, at the very beginning of this Polonaise we immediately have what we really always have before the actual dance starts. At that time, in 19th century especially, it was like this, that the man approached the woman and he, he bowed like this, you know, so up and down, and then she bowed back to him, and then he took the hand, the music started, and then they started to dance. Here, young seven years old Chopin is showing us exactly this scene. So, first bow, and then she answers. And then the, the, the orchestra starts. And then they start to dance. The, the, the really Polonaise starts. But this is like the first introduction. So again, bow. Another. The introduction. And then we start the right Polonaise. And then the Polonaise. The beginning of the Polonaise is probably showing off the technique. Seven years old boy, you know, if you know kids, you probably know that especially boys are like, oh, I want to prove I'm the best. Uh, they, they, they like to, to play, they like to compete, and they like to win. And the Chopin wants to show uh, to his parents probably uh, how well he can play this. <laughs> And what he probably, he made it himself. He said, oh, it's so nice to play like this. So It's not that easy, you know, for seven years old uh, student. But it's actually a, a very um, demanding for a kid. So I'm sure that it was uh, just to create this kind of uh, virtuoso-like effect. So everything starts like this. And then we have very regular phrases. The first phrase as a kind of question and then the second phrase, consequent phrase, which will start from the same material that uh, the first one. So Chopin took it from Mozart, of course, because Mozart composed very similar. Um, and he, he has this sense already in him. Listen, first phrase. <laughs> Q 
question and the second phrase. Starts the same. And the ending is different. Another proof that Chopin was a very good observer is that polonaises usually ended with ta 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 ta. Short, 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 long, short. And on this long, we had another bow. Ta 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 ta. This is a very typical polonaise ending of the phrase. Here we have it. So let's listen again. Question and answer. And then everything is repeated one more time. As we can hear, the left hand has a very simple rhythm. It's not the typical Polonaise rhythm, yam, pa pa pam, 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 as later Chopin will present in his uh, later Polonaises, but here we have a very uh, calm rhythm with eight notes. So, but still, it's on three. One, two, three. After this first phrase, we have the second phrase, and it starts like the beginning. But is it the same? And the beginning was... If you have good ear, you can hear it's different. If you have very good ear, you can even hear that the first one was sad, dark. And the second, when it appears for actually for the third time, because the first is repeated, is what? This is the same melody, but in major key, which means it's brighter and um, it sounds more heroic or more, you know, well, we talk about seven years old boy, so, you know, this kind of heroic. Or full of pride. And then this is another fantastic moment. After this, at the beginning, we have this. So here we should have this. It could be like this, if, and again, if Chopin, as a seven-year-old boy, would not be a genius, he would write like this, because of course he wants to copy the, the same thing in major key. So it should be like this. Something like that. But probably he tried, maybe he tried, but then he thought, oh, it's boring, I don't like it, let's create something new. So here, my friends, he creates something new. This phrase that we are going to listen is very funny. First of all, it's not a typical phrase, like uh, antecedent phrase and then consequent phrase, no. So here we can say it's a um, very, very young composer because he composed as his intuition tells him. But why it is funny? Because probably, it's not for sure, but I imagine this, that here Chopin, when he was playing, he, uh, he turned to his parents and he told them, and now he said, this is you, mommy, this is you, mom. And he played mom and then dad, now this is you. Because here he creates this kind of technique that also Mozart was using, and also was when he was young, that right hand is playing a, um, over the left hand and is playing in the bass. So in the world of the left hand. This is the world of the left hand. Left hand is the king of the bass. But here right hand enters this dark part. 
And this dark part always reminds us of a man. So I can, I imagine when I play this that Chopin is shouting, Mom, like, you know, I sh let's, let's listen to this. Uh, the introduction. <laughs> at the end ta 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 exactly so mom and dad and mom and you know i think when we are teachers of young kids who play this polonaise i think we um, are bound to explain them this structure. We are bound to tell them about this uh, first phrase and then the second phrase, that they are the same, that they start the same, because seven years old, even younger, kids are extremely smart. They are smarter than us. Their brain is like sponge. They, they absorb everything. They, and they want to understand. So if they start to understand the structure things, then when they grow up, where they will be older, they will understand all the very complicated structures like Polonaise Fantasy, Barcarolle, Ballads and, and all the other music. Uh, so I, I don't think we should hide it from them. Anyway, this was part A, so the first part. Then we have the trio. A trio, I mean every Polonaise had a trio. Um, trio, which means free, and it's the traditional um, thing because long, long time before uh, Chopin, 19th century, in Baroque, this middle part of um, dances, especially menuet in France, were called trio because they were played by free instruments. Usually, later they were not anymore played by free instruments, but the title trio was so deeply in the tradition that it stayed. So here we have the so-called trio and in this trio we can say that Chopin grew up while playing a lot of Mozart, that his teacher gave him a lot of Mozart to play. Uh, his teacher Wojciech Żywny was his name. Uh, he was not a pianist, he was a violin a player. But So he didn't really help Chopin with his piano technique, but he gave him a lot of uh, good music by Bach, and by Mozart, and by uh, Clementi, um, and by good composers. He had a very good sense of, of music uh, and good knowledge. Thanks God, because Chopin grew up with Mozart. And here I always love that if Mozart uh, ever wrote Polonaises, th these Polonaises would sound like this, especially young Mozart. Because the left hand plays a Polonaise. One, two, three. One, two, three. But right hand plays the Mozart. It's taken from Mozart's music. So. And now let's listen how this phrase is constructed. It has only two motifs. The motive of fast Mozart notes and my personally favorite motif of bow, but a very sweet bow. Listen. And again. This is the first phrase and then the consequence. Sorry, left hand is changing. And then the ending. In the uh, consequent phrase, right hand stays the same at the beginning, but left hand is changing. And, and, uh, is it familiar for you? It sounds like Mozart, right? Mozart or Clementi or Beethoven or Haydn. Um, because this kind of accompaniment is actually called uh, Alberti bass, because it was the composer Alberti who uh, it is said that he used it for the first time in the history of music. 
so his name is immortal because this kind of way of accompanying the right hand we call Alberti bass. So it sounds like Mozart. And this is the first part of uh, trio. The trio has also the second part the, because also the first part A had two parts. So this is what I said at the beginning. Chopin felt and knew or maybe his teacher told him, we don't know, but he felt that he should compose in part B, in trio, something extra. So what he composed here is very, very, very nice. Listen to the first chord. This is exactly what Chopin writes here. Seven years old Chopin is experimenting with some 20th century music, you know, this sounds awful. Well, I'm joking, but this is, I, I call it this a little, like, seven years old boy wants to be a little naughty, and he wants to show to his teacher, or, uh, or to his father, or to his mother, you know, maybe he just uh, uh, blinked his eye to them, and he says, what can you do to me? I like it, and he, he writes a wrong note. So I call it a wrong note uh, phrase. This is uh, slow, and then fast like a Mozart, and again. And then Chopin comes back to the first phrase of part B. Actually, not to the first, to the consequent phrase. So, the part B has a very simple structure. Phrase number one, then consequent phrase, so number two, it is everything repeated, phrase number one and consequent phrase, then we have the wrong note phrase and consequent phrase again from the, begin the, the beginning, and then again the wrong note phrase and again the consequent phrase, and then uh, trio ends. And after the trio, the tradition uh, of dances ask us to uh, repeat the first part, but without repetitions. So that's exactly how Chopin is doing here. So the conclusion. Definitely uh, this piece is very imaginative, very funny, and maybe a little childish, maybe a little sometimes melancholy, has a lot of different characters, has a mother and a father, and has a virtuosity, and it's not so easy to play for a child, so we can say that seven years old Chopin had already a very good technique. Um, and um, it's very much inspired by Mozart's music, has good proportions, and is very nice to listen to. So I think that's all. Now let's listen to it again and enjoy uh, young Chopin at the beginning of his long, well, not so long, unfortunately, but his life full of beautiful music. We are in shop in 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 Polnes. This we go pam 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 and the beginning. And consequent phrase.
repeated. That's the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you again. Bye bye.